where she was the director of the BFA Communications Design and BFA Design and Technology programs from 20, 2011 to 2014. She serves as the president of the board, um, or she served as the president of the board of directors at AIGA New York from 2014 to 2016. She holds an MFA in graphic design from Yale University School of Art and a BARC from, uh, in architecture from Virginia Tech. She established her small studio EAD in 2005. She's a co-author with Sue Applebaum of the book Designing the Editorial Experience, a primer for print, web, and mobile. Um, I'm actually really excited to have her today because she'll give us a rich and kind of unique perspective of being both practitioner and educator, having, you know, being uh, educated as a graphic designer and an architect, um, and also a writer and maker. So thank you and welcome. Thank you. Do you want to use, you can use this mic. Okay. I'll, I'll use this. Okay. I'll use this one. This will be easier. Okay. Um, or maybe. It's always hard to tell. All right. Here, I'll use this one. It'll be better. <laughs> okay, so I don't know. Is this okay for you guys? All right. I feel kind of. And let's switch this here. Okay. So uh, thank, you, thank you guys for, for coming. Um, I'll probably have a little bit of a different talk from what you guys are used to from the other presentations, just because like, I, was, I was not born as a graphic designer. I was, uh, I was originally an architect. And so I want to talk a little bit about how I wound up from going from architecture into graphic design, and then what are some of the questions that came up from doing that. And, and also just like these kind of questions that are always on my mind, like, this one here, which is, is graphic design architecture and is architecture graphic design. Um, as as Yoon Jane said, I'm a professor at the New Schools Parsons School of Design. Um, I went to Virginia Tech for architecture school and I went and I did a graduate degree in graphic design later. Um, so I, I will do a little bit of a, you know, hi, how are you and show you some work along the way, but mostly I, I wanna focus on some of these, these bigger questions and we'll get to some of these later. Also in thinking about like what happens, where are we now versus where we were then, just some of the recent thoughts that I've had about that. So I wanna give you guys like an idea of just like why did I even become interested in what I do now, which is uh, to give you, I'd, I'd have to start by showing you like what, where Virginia Tech is. So this, uh, and there's a little, okay, so this thing here, right here, that's Virginia Tech. This is Washington DC, this is five hours away. This is Raleigh, North Carolina, four and a half hours away. And then this is Columbus, Ohio. So like, you're talking about a place where uh, we are in a time <clears throat> that is, uh, you know, you just, you just have this enormous amount of distance. And my entire connection to the world was basically through this screen here. This is the VTLS. This is the Virginia Tech Library System, which they uh, claim, claim fame to. And this is our library over to the right. Um, which I also worked in later on, but like so, and you know, we are so used to the environment that we're in now. But uh, I, I can't emphasize enough how, in this moment, when I was an undergraduate, like if I wanted to see what uh, a picture of a building in Japan looked like, for example, I had to like go to the library, look it up on this machine, and go to go to find a book that had that picture in it, and that was it. Like there was really no other way. Um, Sometime during this time, uh, this was about my third year, we had to do a, uh, a, a case study of a building. And uh, we did a case study of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in DC and went to go visit Pay Cobb Freedom Partners here in New York. And so me and my team, we, we did this trip to New York. And we stopped at the Guggenheim at some point and I, I was rifling through the bookstore and I ran across this book and I, I, I love like, I just love this thing because of what it engendered later because the, the book was, was uh, torn in half. So because it was torn in half, it happened to be half off. So uh, I, I, with my uh, Blacksburg, Virginia uh, pocket money, was able to purchase this, this book here. And it was very much my introduction to architectural theory. Uh, because the, at the time, you know, again, like here's, here's our building, this is our library building. It was the only architect design building on the Virginia Tech campus. And, and, you know, and I had rolled into architecture thinking that it was gonna be math plus art, but 
all that I got in architecture school was that I had two choices. I could either be into this, so you could be a big Mies van der Rohe fan, or I could be into this, which was Carlos Scarpa. So if you were like hard-hearted, you could be a Mies van der Rohe fan, and if you were soft, you could do Carlos Scarpa. And I was this person who was not really, I did not, I didn't come from anything that was able to gel with either of those things. And so when I picked up that book that was in the Guggenheim and I started rifling through it, and it was, it's, it's, it's amazing now to think about it too because it was designed by Massimo Vignelli and like it has, uh, it does so, it does so well with like so many really crappy images. It's just proceedings from a conference. Um, but I just slowly got into like all of these new, new ideas. Um, I should also mention at the time that, uh, you know, the whole idea of whether or not you should make architecture on a computer was still a debate. Um, it is still a debate in a lot of schools in the United States still. So, but like this was, this was the state of, um, of AutoCAD and all that kind of stuff. And then over to your right, that was the state of the internet at that time. So we're talking like 95, 96. And <clears throat> again, you know, like if we, uh, you know, we were an Ulm-inspired school. It was like everybody, everything was a modernist, and you know, everybody we talked about was dead. And and the idea was like you you really wanted to be making these kinds of drawings. And of course, like it was pretty clear that this world was coming. So it was was really unclear to me like what it was that I was going to do between these two things. And in the in the meantime, I was really deeply interested in this stuff. You know, so like I was a huge John Haydick fan. Uh, I just loved all of these drawings and all of these books that he was producing. Um, I was a huge Peter Eisenman fan also, like of, of all of these kinds of iterations of, of visuals, of form, of geometry. Remember again, I was into art and math, like I wasn't really into this whole idea that we were going to like create poetic space. Um, Liebeskin's drawings, Zaha Hadid's drawings. And I mean, I find this stuff like really interesting to look at now because like we are in this very digital time and it's hard to remember back to, you know, back to the 90s really like when you have this being this completely different type of form and then you have just, you know, even, even with this, so this is Liebes Woods, the Zagreb free zone, you have um, the Berlin free zone, uh, you know, all of that stuff is influenced from the 60s, from Archigram, and then you have, you know, you get to things like this where it's like, oh my God, you know, as an architect, I can produce a, uh, a zine like this. And like, this was something that was in our library. I probably like picked it up and checked it out like a thousand times. And, <clears throat> and again, like, you know, just to kind of look at like what was in the library at the time, you know, so you had all of these communications that were there all, you know, that I would be waiting each month, you know, for the new Domus Casabella to come out. There were all of these newer uh, theory uh, publications as well, Zodiac. I was in love with any, uh, just in love, in love with any, because I had, I had that book, the any one. And again, like when I pick up that any one book in the bookstore at the Guggenheim, I'm, I'm 20 years old. I don't know anything. You know, I just pick it up because it's 20, it's half off and it's pink and I kind of think I might be able to read it. Um, you know, and, and it, this is just something to also consider, you know, like we make so much of the things now, like in the, in a, with an idea that we're only speaking to the people who already know more than we do. Whereas like, you know, you have to also think about all the people who know less than you do. But, but anyway, just to kind of give you a better picture of like, so what kind of person I was at the time when I graduated, the one thing that I was excited about for architecture school, the one excitement that was left was that we had to make a book for our fifth year. So like, it was like a requirement that the thesis be a book. And I was like, yes. So what I did was I threw myself completely into making the book. And this was the thesis book that I made um, for, my, for my graduation. And, <clears throat> and you know, it, it just, and, and this was the book that I moved to New York with like in the end. And I want to take a little pause and quote uh, Michael Rock, who you guys heard from yesterday, um, say, who says, architecture is born and dies as graphic design. And like this was so much true for me at that time, and it still is now, that you have all of this kind of output you know, of drawings, of, of material you know, in the very beginning, and then you have this kind of packaging at the end. And in a lot of ways, like I kind of went to the death part of it afterwards, too, after I graduated in terms of making, making things for architecture. So, so that's like, you know, so this whole question of like, I, me gravitating towards these things, like architecture was very much a type of graphic design for me at that point. I would kind of dispute it a little bit now, but I, I want to get into like the next question, which is, is graphic design architecture? 
um, because when I graduated, I, I, I went and so I, again, I was obsessed with any, so I applied to be an editorial assistant when I moved to New York. I, I really wasn't interested in designing buildings that much. Like I wasn't gonna be convincing in an interview. Um, and you know, and, and I, I really wanted to be making the things that were around architecture. I really wanted to make the books and the publications and the magazines. Um, I didn't know anything about uh, how to do any of this stuff though, because I was an architect. So, um, <clears throat> but I, so I went to go work, I went to interview with Cynthia Davidson at Any, and she was like, look, you know, we really like you. Uh, you seem really smart, but you don't know anything. So um, why don't you go apply to, my, my husband needs an archivist, why don't you go and apply with him? And I was like, oh, okay, who's your husband? And that already indicated like how much I knew because I didn't know that she was married to Peter Eisenman. And <clears throat> so I went to go work for Peter. And you know, while I was the, his archivist, like I that was only one part of the job description. I did everything that the architects didn't do in the office. So like I was the, if somebody, if, if, if there needed to be an exhibition set up in Istanbul, I was the one who like went and did it. Uh, if somebody left their umbrella in a restaurant, like I was the one who went and fetched it. You know, so like it was like both, both things. Um, I did learn more in those two years, however, than at any point before, just because like no one had ever uh, expected that much from me before that point. So, and after two years of being there and like generally doing all of this stuff, like I started to kind of get a little grouchy after about a year. And I said like, look, you know, I have this design degree. All I'm doing is I'm, I'm purchasing toilet paper for the office. Like, is there something else I can do? And so he was like, well, you know, that's cute that you like, you want to do design stuff. Like, why don't you go ahead and, you know, Rizzoli wants us to do this little book. Why don't you go ahead and do it? And of course, like he knew me quite well. So he, you know, he was like, yeah, she'll like, she'll stay if she does this book. So I did. And, um, and so I, I threw myself into making this book and I, and I still really, I mean, this is still like one of my favorite projects that I've ever done just because of the way that I approached it. Um, you know, I had, because at that time too, like when I was working in his office, I, I transcribed all of his lectures and I organized all that material. And so I had this like very deep understanding of the material, but because I was the per person who fetched the umbrellas and, and ordered the toilet paper, I never felt qualified to actually say anything about it. You know, it wasn't my place to do so. Um, so the book, in some ways, was a way to express some of the ideas I had about what his work was about, which and w at what point it changed. And there is there is a kind of um, point where he went from these kind of more um, platonic or geometric explorations into like more real or representational forms. And I just wanted to say that basically. Um, and I still think like I and I kind of love this too, just because like it's. Uh, uh, I would never ever make a table of contents in a book now like this, but because at the time I was like, well, naturally, like the table of contents should exactly show you the proportions of like what's in the book. Like I, I don't know, it was just the way that I approached it. Um, but anyway, like even in the middle of all of this, though, it still wasn't enough to keep me in the office. So I finally uh, left in '98, and uh, I. I had answered some ads in the, we had newspapers that you would look through ads to find jobs and stuff. So there was one uh, for the Museum of Modern Art. And so I, I went and I wound up working there in their graphics department for a little while. And it was kind of interesting to see what they uh, saw in me because they were like, well, you're an architect. So therefore, um, naturally you should be able to do big type. You know, so like anything that was like larger than sort of paragraph type, they were like, she should do it. And so I did all of the big type and the maps. I should be able to do maps. I made some like really horrific uh, illustrator files out of this, by the way. Um, but, uh, but it was really a nice introduction to uh, graphic design. And, and throughout this whole period too, I was always, you know, I was always thinking like, well, this is just kind of, I'm just taking a break, you know, we'll get back together, it'll be fine, you know, like I'm, you know, so I, I kind of saw it as a, as a way of taking a break. And during the time that I was there too, um, you know, the, the people at Rizzoli, they were like, well, you know, you did this book with Peter Eisenman, obviously you can work with difficult people, so like, why don't you do a book with Daniel Liebeskind, why don't you do a book with Karen Rashid? So like, I started to kind of, I was freelancing on the side while I was there, um, and, you know, and, and also like, uh, you know, I, I continued also to work with Peter, like we worked on the Blurred Zones book together, that's the one in the middle here, and, um, 
and you know, again, like I'm starting my project like this, you know, like this is like, I'm thinking like this is the way to do it. Like first you make a site plan, right? You know, it's like you make, you figure out like exactly what are, what's all the content in the book. Um, you know, I had a lot of ideas about also like the effects of the different pages. And while I'm, I'm, free, I'm working at MoMA, I'm freelancing, working on these books, and when I was sitting one time like working on this book with, with Peter, he was like, why don't you just be a graphic designer? And I was just like, graphic designer? Because like whenever I thought of graphic designer, I thought of something like this. I was like, no. And like, and, I, and, and, the, and I'll say like, I mean, he didn't mean it as a compliment. You know, like that was definitely not his intention. But in a lot of ways, like he really was pretty correct about, about that. Um, but, you know, I, and I had, it just had a rough time reconciling. But also at the time, you know, I'm at MoMA and my, uh, supervisor there is a woman named Ingrid Chu, and she had gone to Yale um, for her graduate degree. And she was she was always kind of with me by the by the printer, you know, saying like, "Hey, you know, maybe you should apply to school, and like maybe you should do this." And and so the and and again, like, so I'm getting these two messages at the same time. But at the time, I'm just thinking. Um, no, you know, like architecture and I will get back together. It'll be fine. I'll go to graduate school for architecture. You know, it's just a separation. Like we're, we're gonna be fine. Um, but but in the end, like I, you know, I, I basically said like, okay, well, if I if I get into the program, like maybe I'll I'll commit and I'll I'll do this. Like I'll I'll, I'll definitely do it. And and so when I went to uh, so I did go to Yale and and I have to say. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and you, you guys will hear from one of my contemporaries at the time, and I'm sure he can corroborate this. I made the weirdest work at Yale, like just because I didn't really, I didn't have a graphic design background, and I didn't really like I, I, I definitely knew how to make things because I had been making things, um, but I didn't really, uh, uh, I just didn't follow the, I, I just couldn't get with the program. So, um, but there were a couple of things that were really nice, like you know, I kind of got to explore some of the, like the material things that I really was interested in. Um, I, also, uh, I also got to kind of re-examine, because we got to do a book, again, thesis book, like making books. Uh, so we got to do, a, I got to do a thesis book for, th for that too, where I got to kind of go back and look at some of the projects that I had done before I went to school and ask questions like, why did I, why did I do things that way? Like this is, it's just such a weird way to approach things because, you know, and this, what I'm showing you here, like this was the diagram that started that diagram diaries book. So like this was like my approach to starting that book. Like now if I approach a book or the way I'm kind of trained to approach a book now is to like think about like what's the identity and like how do I, what, like I'll start by choosing a font for example, whereas like this was, this was much more of a priority for me at that time. So anyway, so 20 years later, so I just want to, now's the sort of more, more talking and reflecting part. So 20 years later, we can ask this question again of like, is, is graphic design architecture, right? You know, so like what, uh, where, like where are we now? And I have to say like the, the uh, again, kind of zooming us back like to maybe 10 years ago, like the whole question of uh, living in the internet, like the worry was that it would be like this. You know, people thought, like there was a lot of talking, especially in architecture, about Second Life and like how, you know, we would be building these virtual spaces that would look like our physical spaces and like would we be confused between our virtual spaces and our physical spaces and like what are we going to do? And like no one, no one imagined that we would be living in this kind of digital space where, you know, we had social media and like we had this kind of, uh, uh, like pulling away of like basically like truth and reality like by the time like in, in a very short space of time so um, and also like uh, uh, what what has what where with where we are now I think ideas some of these some of the newer ideas are really important I mean I don't know how many of you guys have read this book but if you haven't I would recommend it um, but uh, you know in in are we human uh, Beatrice Colomina and Mark Wigley like they basically say like look you know like what we're designing in turn designs us you know so like if you, what you're making like the world that you're making is is creating humans in return and you're kind of responsible for that in certain ways and uh, and I do think that that's that's absolutely true um, especially when like the environment that you live in kind of looks like this and you know, like this is basically like half of my sort of perceptual day sort of looks like this. So, you know, I read a lot, I read a lot of stuff on my phone, I write a lot of stuff on my phone, and and it's like I think a lot about like what does it do to us, you know, to be experiencing our world in this way. Um, and and it's, it's funny because it brings us almost back to like a lot of the same questions too, like uh, why does everything look the same? Um, what about accessibility? 
How does design define and change culture? Uh, how do the ideas of our time influence form? What's our relationship to capital? So these are all really big questions for uh, what in my mind is graphic design. And graphic design for me is, is everything. It's not like just the brochures or whatever. You know, it's like the entire expression of the experience with content to me is graphic design. So, but when it comes to architecture, you know, there's this whole, uh, some things don't change, you know, so buildings don't move, they're, they're not easily collapsible into two dimensions. It's really hard to express a building in another form. Um, but there's a really, really big difference between experiencing, it's experiencing a building uh, from a distance like this uh, or experiencing it like this. And so I think there is, I think for you guys, like there's this whole question of what is gonna be that relationship of the built form to, to the communication of that built form, um, especially when like also there's this whole question of building things just so that they can uh, be, you know, shared and snapped and all this kind of stuff. So like this whole, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, ax grinding of the 90s was like, oh, it's paper architecture. You know, none of that stuff matters. You gotta build a building where the ceiling leaks or whatever. And like now it's like more, is it Instagrammable? Which I think is like a really, uh, it's like through the looking glass, you know, at this point, like once you get to this, when, once you get to this phase. And, and I, think, I think both of these, however, do have within them uh, some questions about the relationship of architecture to graphic design. Um, other things have changed too. There's a much tighter relationship to marketing, real estate, capital. Um, you know, so you have, you're making, you're making architecture that creates graphic design that like moves money from place to place, which I think is a really weird uh, uh, purpose for graphic design. Like we had this whole, uh, uh, again, like kind of uh, um, worry and anxiety about like the Bill Bow effect, you know, that like people would make buildings just to bring people to places, which to me feels really quaint because now the building is built not to bring people there, but to like just move money from like one bank account into another bank account, which is like a whole other dimension and a very abstract one. Um, similar things though happen, you know, also in our world, like, so we, you know, we really went from having a kind of more concrete industrial world of making books and other objects to like now we, there's a huge rise of uh, book fairs, conferences, content. There's very, it's very difficult now to make graphic design that's not also uh, coinciding with some sort of event. Uh, art is going through a very similar uh, turn as well. Um, so there, there's a strange time basedness like to the whole activity that that is also very very new. Um, there's so much more of it, and it's kind of cool, you know, to have all of this. But it, it's also kind of bizarre and a little scary. Um, this is also to me kind of like awesome and scary, which is uh, this is the New York Art Book Fair attendance. Like so, it went from I think like 16,000 people to 35,000 people over three or four years. And and again, this is all connected to the internet, like this is not, this has nothing to do with, um, you know, people just suddenly being interested in stuff. It has a lot to do with the whole like, is it Instagrammable sort of thing? And, and, and it's, it's so, so it's like really shifted like the context in which people are working. Um, and then meanwhile, and some of this is, is you guys' stuff here, um, you know, there, there's also a very different uh, um, attitude towards architectural communication online. And like a lot of people trying to figure that out in different ways, which I, I think is interesting and like both kind of similar, but not, but like it's, it's uh, and then the thing though that gets me is that you have all of this stuff. So, you know, I, I think about that moment of going to the library and there's the, there's a thing of magazines and they're very much chosen. Whereas like there's, there's this like really, there's so much excellent thinking online now that you know, much more so than there was 20 years ago, but it's up against like so much of a gigantic mountain of trash that like it's really hard to figure out what is what and what are the differences and like how do you actually start to rise above this? Um, and so, you, so the space of like working in, uh, in, in graphic design that has something to do with architecture now is just different. Um, you know, so a lot of the work that I do now, uh, you know, has, is, is either like specifically for an event, like this was for an exhibition, um, and this is also Brad Klopfeld, this was for, uh, and, and this is, this is a, a Hachikant's thing that was a distributed art publisher's thing, which is like, you know, so there's a lot more of this kind of do it all yourself sort of graphic design that's happening rather than the more like Rizzoli type of stuff that I was doing before. Um, and, and it's distributed very, very differently. Uh, and 
So a lot of like, but also because of that too, like a lot of this work is a lot more prescribed because you're, you're actually like thinking about like how is it gonna get represented like when you make it. And <clears throat> recently, so just to kind of, I know I'm just bouncing you guys back and forth, but recently in April there was an, uh, an exhibition on John Haydick in the Cooper Union that I went to and it was just like, so amazing to revisit some of these projects because these are the things again that I had kind of grown up with at the time and and it would just be impossible like in some ways like they resemble the work that you'll see in a book fair just for their just because the book fair stuff is so nostalgic but uh, there's there are moves and there are organizations and there's an inscrutability to these publications that you just would never have now and so I really wonder like you know can you make Mask of Medusa now like as an architect I I, I don't know like and, and if you did like what would it be and it's such a it's such a different um, uh, attitude towards like a publication than than what we have now. Uh, what was awesome though is that they also rebuilt, uh, you know, this is also very graphic architecture too, right? And it, it was always questionable too whether you could call it architecture. So this is the house of the suicide and the house of the suicide's mother. Um, and and it's, it's so bizarre to like be experiencing this stuff now too because like you go around the corner and uh, and this is where I, I'll, I'll throw you guys back in the present. So the cor so this is a photo that I took out the Strand, and the entire back section of the Strand uh, used to be all art and architecture, and then they moved all the art and architecture stuff upstairs, and they replaced it with cookbooks, which I think is really interesting because now almost all the work I do now is cookbooks, and like cookbooks are really big, and they're you know people are always buying cookbooks in the same sort of fetishistic way that they used to buy architecture books. And so like, and, and, and things, and a lot of other things have changed as well. So like a lot of my work now, like in terms of its environment looks like this. I do still make models of things. So this is like a small model of a book that I did and laid out. Um, this is in a space that we were working in. Um, you know, I still iterate like everything like one after the other, like just always making, making, making to like arrive at something. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still uh, working out like, you know what is the whole sequence of the book, and like what's the what's the actual map of 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 the thing? Like much more interests me a lot more than the kind of identity of the book, and and one of the things that connect also with architecture a lot is, uh, or maybe the only thing for me, which I just try to hang on to, and you guys will hear next from commercial type, which I'm super excited about, um, is uh, is is that everything now is like about type, like, and I, I it's really hard for me to do a project now without making type for it because there's just something so elemental about about doing that. So I'll 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 make type, I'll make the type into typefaces, and then I'll use that in books. And then this is this is type for an identity project with that same client, um, which then turned into like different variations of the identity. Here it is back stuck onto a piece of architecture. Um, and, and, and this is like, this is the way that I work now, you know, which is just, uh, everything is at, at a distance, you know, the work is at a distance, like, and the, uh, if I go and be with people, I'm with them, like, I'm in, here I am in the basement, you know, of this, of this restaurant in San Francisco, and it's just really, really different from what I had imagined 20 years ago, because I always thought that I would be working like this, like, this was like the dream, you know, that you're going to work in a studio, and, and I, but I have to say, like there are there are real joys in in this in this new uh, environment. Um, but I, so this is the kind of uh, polemic part of this. Um, so one, you know, since you guys are architects, like I just really want to uh, uh, underscore, and this goes back to the uh, Are We Human book. Like you make the environment, and the environment makes you. So like the, the the degree to which you also influence, like what is being published about architecture? What does it look like? What is that world? Who does it reach? What is its audience? Like then reflects back in turn and creates the kind of architecture that it makes. You know. So like if you uh, if you're not paying attention to that, like it's really hard for for the the whole sequence to to you have you have a lot of influence by by doing that. So you know you're. What you're making influences what you're what you're looking at influences what you're making, and then one of the best things about architecture is the possibility of autonomous conversation. And I say this because you know we are in a field in graphic design, like all of us that you see here, like we like we all know each other, but like we don't we don't have a kind of apparatus or a structure that has already been built to like co to communicate amongst ourselves in a way to about the things that we do in the way that architecture does. 
And, and I know that like there, there were many, many years of people saying like, oh, but that's such a waste of time and those people aren't like, you know, they're not doing, you know, you, but it's, it's really, really important to have that conversation in order to then influence like the architecture that is made, made next. And, you know, if you're in architecture school or your firm and like you're making your stuff to show the world like how expensive you're going to be, like, yeah, I would tell you, like, go ahead and like hire, you know, the sharpest knife in the drawer or graphic designer you can find, you know, find somebody who does that all day, every day, you know, do that. But, you know, for the stuff that is about like the conversation you're having amongst yourselves, especially about, especially when it comes to that early work and that early graphic work, I, I just feel like there, there's a sense of that fearlessness that's been lost to be able to kind of autonomously be producing these works and to like be, be sharing them amongst yourselves and like, I, and whether it's digital or it's physical, I just think it's a really uh, fantastic thing to do just both for yourself and for the field. Um, and I also, I mean, I know it's nerve wracking because like everything's visible and every, you know, everybody's watching you on everything, you know, it's like everybody's watching you on Instagram and Twitter and whatever, but like at the same time, it, it is possible. And if you throw yourself into it, like it, it, it's possible to, to uh, really change the direction of like, what is the thinking and what is the making that is in the field of architecture uh, in a way that just doing, you know, that kind of more external uh, uh, partnership cannot do. Like I just think it's it's an it's an it's an important thing to do. Um, I'll leave you guys off with a couple of of thoughts. So I, I wrote a book last year um, that was about my field, not my field now, my new field, um, my new relationship, uh, which is graphic and communication design. And uh, I I interviewed three different architects within it, and uh, one of them is my friend Luke, and he said. Uh, which I, I just think is great. He said, the word amateur has within it the suggestion, well, he's, he first talked about how, I know I asked him like, what did you get out of your architecture education? And he said like, well, one of the best things about architecture education is that it makes you into excellent amateurs. Like you're always like really game to like pick up some new thing. And, and he said, and I, he was like, and I don't mean that in a like a derogatory sense. He's like, the word amateur has within it the suggestion of a, of a love of doing things. So in some ways, it can also be a way to avoid the kind of professionalization that tends to kill a certain spirit and sensibility of exploration. And and so like there was something about him saying that that kind of made me think about like all the work that I just showed you and all the the stuff that I was looking at before of just thinking like you know where where did that fearlessness go like to just go ahead and throw in and like make things and be amateur in that more loving way and and I'll end with uh, just a, you know a thought that I've had lately which is you know at the time too if you look at graphic design theory, there's always like this whole question of like, is graphic design a kind of writing? And I'll propose to you that graphic design is not a kind of writing, that it's a kind of reading. And in that sense, it's also a kind of way of loving things. And so you know, any opportunity that you get to do that, I would encourage you to do so. So, and that's it for me. Hello. Follow me on Twitter. <laughs> Very important. Any, any, do we do Q&A or no? Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you, Justin. Do we have any questions? <laughs> can, can you? <laughs> How do you design a typeface? How do you design a typeface? Uh, I mean, there are a hundred different ways to design a typeface. Uh, one, I mean, there, there are more official, like you can, you can learn how to do it right, or you can just do it on your own. Um, you could, you can use really. There are a lot of accessible online tools for for typeface design. The most most accept, accessible is one called Fontstruct, where you can just go ahead and like make a a, a grid based typeface. A little bit uh, uh, more complicated, but still free, I think, is something called Glyph that people have been using. Um, I totally encourage typeface design for, and I, maybe this is my way of uh, plugging um, my, our, our next guest here. I totally encourage typeface design to, to architects because typeface design is all about space. And it's all about like the space around a letter and within a letter and, and then the relationship between characters so that they're all equally different. And like I, that whole mode of thinking is just so much closer 
to the kind of thinking that re is required for making a building or for making a plan, then it then you're like, is this going to appeal to somebody? You know, which I like never really like. I don't really care like if something appeals to some, you know like it's it's not something that I feel as close to. But like type design is like this awesome obsessive thing where you're you know it's like you because you go ahead and you start making it and then when you as you get into like the later letters and things like you get to W and then you have to redo everything else and it's and I, I love that like I think it's the best I think it's the best thing and it's and it's strange too because like I in terms of the projects that I do like I just I have such a hard time just kind of pulling a typeface off the shelf and then using it um, I also have a uh, a hard time with like I I, I I love all the new type but it now it, to me it, it's so associated with startups and with venture capital that like I'm always trying to figure out how to buck that and there's two ways you can do it you can use old type and finesse the hell out of it or you can use uh, or you can make your own type um, otherwise it'll be perfect and if it's perfect uh, it will it will look like that kind of money so it's it's a really weird kind of dilemma I think so um, other 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 questions? much more of the architectural book type yeah and now you mentioned you're doing more of like a cookbook type and how that changes your approach to design um, based on who you're imagining these books are made for well it's it's tough because you know again like I started with that architecture book uh, you know but I was this audience who knew nothing right and and so I always want to be interested in but then never quite get interested in uh, books or publications that are made for like like that are more insidery just because I feel like if it leaves out that person in if there's no way in I find it really hard to love it you know so I, I've really and this is this is like a kind of crisis for me because like you know in, in our world like the, the the lower the lower number of copies that something has like especially if you can get down to one like there's only one copy available like the more valuable something is it's like and most of the books that I was doing earlier they you know they were uh, I mean, they weren't like super small run, but like they it, like usually that two thousand to five thousand realm is like what uh, an architecture book is, um, if they print one at all. At this point, there's really very few architecture books now that aren't like associated with with selling something else. But um, but the 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 cookbook is fifty thousand, so like it's a very different space, and and so you can kind of get in there and like do things that you know will reach people who are not looking for that. And there's something really exciting to me about that. Like I, and, but that's, that's a totally personal thing for me that, that I always want to have something there that, that somebody who is unfamiliar, doesn't, is not in it, is gonna like grab into and is gonna be able to like connect into that larger, so that, you know, so that those other books that I also love, you know, that they can actually get there at some point, you know, through, through these other things. I mean. I don't know, that's a complicated way of saying it. But yeah, like I think having things be a little more general is 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 kind of cool. Uh, when you're making your maps sort of initial pages, are there any questions you ask yourself or rule of thumb you have about how you start begin to lay something out to create that narrative? Well, I'm always asking like well, what's uh, I mean the first question and I usually have the client there for this you know so my process for making a book now is like I will sit down for three days I'll make the maps I'll make the whole book and I'll just I'll just make it and then I'll sit down with the client with them sitting next to me and then we'll start we'll start making the book you know so like I just I just go ahead and make the whole thing no no sample pages no whatever like it's just the full the full thing um, my question is always like how, how is somebody going to experience this work and what are what are they what are they going to get out of it that's like a, a larger uh, question um, the the first question though to the client before we even get started is is this a book or is this a brochure um, and and I, I think it's a really, really important question to ask before you make anything, because if it's a brochure, then you can just, yeah, you can just go straight into just like, is, does it look nice and whatever, and like leave it at that. But if it's a book, then somebody who is reading it 
depending on who they are and how they go through it and how much of it they go through, we'll, we'll develop different insights, like depending on, depending on that. So like if they only read the interviews, like they'll get one thing, or if they only do that, you know, like so that you have built into the book a whole set of different experiences. Otherwise, like it's just a brochure. And a lot of books are brochures, you know, like I, I, I'll, I'll, g I'll give you that. But, um, but a book it has a point of view that is expressed through the, through the organization of the content and the naming of that content. That um, that makes it a book. Otherwise, it's not a book. Um, how do you walk the line between trend and appeal? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you see, like I think. Well, I think you always have to. I mean, the way I usually explain it to students is I say like uh, it's kind of like when you're. Um, like if you're, if you look at a group of goth kids, like in a high school, I don't even know if they still exist. Are kids still goth? They might be. So to you, they all look the same. You know, like they all look totally the same, right? They have black eyeliner, they've got black clothes on. Um, but then to each, each goth kid, all the others are different because like they have Doc Martens on, but their Doc Martens are purple. And the other ones have laces that are slightly different. So like you always have to decide like how much do you need to be look, look like other things to be in the group and to be recognized as part of the group? And then what do you need to do to differentiate from the group? So I think if you completely throw yourself outside of it, like you're, you're, that's not good because then you're not, no one's recognizing uh, you. And like we're humans, right? So like humans are born to recognize things. Like when you have a, a year and a half old kid, he's like giraffe, hippo, rhino. He's like never met any of these animals, but like the first exercise that you have is in recognition. And so like you spend the rest of your life like going through just like saying like, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? And like you're just always recognizing, you're always asking those questions. And so if as a designer, you don't answer that question immediately, like you're, you, you fail, you know, so you have to answer that question. But then if you answer that question and your, your thing looks exactly like everything else, uh, it becomes lost again because you cannot differentiate like between your thing and the other thing. And, and it's really, um, I think this is really bad for us now, especially with, uh, with phones, because like you're, you're talking about a space of a business card to like try to differentiate between things. And so, like for example, if there's a lecture series here, and there's a lecture series, uh, like you guys have this beautiful stuff for Syracuse, you know, for example, and there's a lecture series at UCLA, and there's a lecture series in Texas, like on a poster, they can all look incredibly different, you know, because there's a lot of space there to to uh, experiment and like do different things. On on the space on a space that's this big, it's really really hard for them not to look all exactly the same, um, you know. So it's it's just, it's constantly thinking about like, how is it different and how is it the same? I think, you know, in terms of tre like, tre like trend to me is like, how much are you the same? And then what was your other word? Uh, appeal. appeal. And appeal, appeal's a weird one, but like appeal, I, I actually don't think that things that are the same are appealing, you know, but I, I think appeal is kind of like that, that surprise, it's like rituals and surprises, you know? So like you do the ritual of making it look like the architecture school or whatever, and then you do the surprise of like, this is a new thing. I've never seen this before. I'm interested. I, like, I want to be in it. So like that's that's how I think is the best. I mean, it's almost like a mechanical description of like what we do, but like that that is kind of what we do all the time. It has nothing to do with what we personally like, just to make to be clear. Uh, is there anyone else? Uh, I mean, I think that that, like, I think the content is the design to such a huge degree and the editing of that content. Um, generally speaking, though, most people don't see a graphic designer as being capable of being involved in content selection and editing, which I think is still a surprise to me, like, whenever I encounter it. Um, they're like, no, 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 we already figured out, like, here's a table of contents and here's the stuff. Like, most publishing house processes, in fact, are built that way. You know, so they actually will request that the author do the entire manuscript complete, you know, even with the images ordered already, like before they hand it over to a designer, which I just find confounding because like it's it's a really it's it's a it's a way to make a book that looks like a WordPress template. Like if you do that, like you really come up with nothing because they, the the author usually is not um, 
is not good at understanding how somebody's reading their work. You know, like they're they're good at writing it, or they're good at the they're good at understanding what the content is, but they they don't really they're not going to like turn that around in their mind a few times before writing it down. So, um, so I usually just kind of I mean I'm. I'm a pain in the neck when it comes to that because I, I usually will just go in and I'll just start changing stuff and I'll just start like moving stuff around or adding more content or whatever and then like but but the way that I you can only do that if you gain trust and and I gain trust by usually like I usually start each of these projects by just going and spending like two three days with someone just like listening and asking them questions and at the point at which they decide that I understand what it is that they do they usually like relax and they let me get my hands in the content and like, you know, actually move the content around. But some, there, are, there are moments there where you just have no control and like that's like a really tough, tough thing. And if you're doing anything for the web that's like more of a, a container, like you definitely have no control over the content. So then you have to like just focus on making a really heavy frame so that like whatever comes through it is just gonna survive that, 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 that process you know, so that it's not gonna be as selective or as picky. Like the, the more, the more, um, the more selected and the more precise the content selection is, the more minimal the design can be too. Like, so like if, if, if the content is perfect and it's beautiful, like I don't have to do anything. Like you can just like stick it on the page and like make sure that like, you know, it's, it's uh, like the proportions are not like awful. But like if things are, if you have no, like if you do an exhibition with like a hundred different artists, like you gotta make sure that the whole thing looks like, like there's flashing lights and everything to like not make it look like a complete like fresh kills disaster. Cause it's, you know, you don't have any control over that. So. Oh, you see, like that's a, I think that's the question. Like my, like I, I'd love to recommend my route, of course, um, but you know, that's not necessarily like the only way or the best way. I mean, the only, graphic design is a practice. So like the more you practice it, it's the same way as like if you wanted to take up ceramics, you know, like I would tell you to like go make some ceramics and go hang out with people who know things so that they can tell you what's wrong with your pots. You know, so, uh, and graphic design is the same. If you can get yourself in a situation, like one of the things that was really good about working at MoMA was uh, there was just an infinite number of projects, you know. So like that first year before I went to grad school, like we used to have these corporate forms, um, you know, for each of the projects because they were, we were an internal agency. And I did 77 projects in that year, you know, just like, if it, whatever it was, you know, it's like, oh, we need a letterhead for the education department. You know, it was like, I would just go ahead and do it. Do it. So like the more you do it, the, and the more you get some feedback, like the better, the better you get at it. So I would definitely recommend that overall. How you manage to do that, especially now, is really, really rough because, you know, we are all like now collections of aggregated data on LinkedIn or whatever. So like people are less likely to give you the chance to make stuff. Um, if they, if you don't already show that you've been able to make exactly the same thing before, you know, so, so I think a lot of it now maybe the next turn is to just do a lot of your own work and like you know a lot of your own content to be able to explore and experiment with with the medium. Um, so that would be my just to do it. I mean, there's no there's no barrier in graphic design. That's the one wonderful thing about it. Like I, I mean, you can like walk, you can decide like right now like I'm a graphic designer and like just like pick up your laptop and like there you are. Like there's no um, and I love that because, you know, architecture, if you decide especially that you want to work for yourself, um, like that's, that's like good luck to you. You know, like there's, there's really uh, not, there's really like two or three very set paths in architecture unless you're independently wealthy. So it's really, um, uh, I'm sure you guys all already know this. So like, it, um, so, so it was really, I mean, I didn't go into graphic design. I mean, I went to graphic design partly because I loved these things, you know, like I loved books and I loved like going through content and like I'm a reader, like I just, I read all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the appeal was the fact that I could always work for myself and like that I didn't have to apologize for it and I could just keep doing it. Like there's no, all I needed was a laptop. It's true, that's all you need. Like you don't need anything else in a community, a laptop and a community, so. Um, 
I mean, UI is not going to solve anything in, in graphic design, but uh, I, I see the I see any any um, temp tampering with like the experience of a person and content as being graphic design. So, uh, I mean, UI is definitely part part of that. Uh, what I see as a kind of danger zone, though, is like there's so much there's so much templating at this point. You know, it's like even with UI, like even if I was to teach you, all of you this afternoon, like UI design, I would start you off with like a bootstrap template, um, you know, because there's all these like kind of efficiencies within the making of digital products, and the efficiencies develop their own, like they 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 kind of dictate what things are going to look like, you know, so. Uh, you know, the tools dictate what things are going to look like, the efficiencies dictate what things are going to look like. So eventually you start to roll into this uh, pattern where like a lot of that stuff looks very similar. And so that that's, and I don't think that, I don't see that changing. I see like more and more templates coming, you know, like it's going to be like, you're going to push a button, it's going to read your brain and it's going to make a website for you, you know, like, so that's, uh, I, and, and that will work for, you know, 90% of projects, you know, that's the other thing too, like there's so much, uh, there is a gigantic mountain of trash, you know, that is created every single day, and like there is no real need for humans to make it in a lot of ways. So, um, but the question of like what is going to be that ten percent that's going to be better? Uh, that that's kind of interesting. Like I, I actually think that to ignore the the web and you know mobile, all that stuff is to like ignore half of human experience. So, like you have to be able to like look at it, think about it, have an opinion about it be able to make it. Like, I don't see why not. <clears throat> OK. Is good? There aren't more questions. Maybe I'll ask you one question that, yeah. that I, I always think about. Um, you know, having only been trained as a graphic designer and having you know, uh, practiced as a graphic designer for many years, but that I am exposed to architects a lot. I work a lot. You know, as a studio, we work a lot with architectural content. I'm a fan of architecture. I teach architecture students, um, and there's you know incredible sort of overlap between the two two fields. But then there's also these kind of very very different aspects to um, to the two sides as well. Um, in your experience, what do you think we can learn from each other, graphic designers from architects and architects from graphic designers? Oh, that's that's a good question. I mean, I can definitely speak to like what graphic designers can learn from architects, and part of that is a is a moving away from the sort of professionalism and like moving towards like, oh, I'm just gonna like go ahead and and roll into things that I don't know anything about. Like that that sort of courage I think is is missing in a lot of graphic design. Also like the um, the idea that talking to each other about what we do is itself valuable and that it doesn't need to be validated outside of the field, I think is also kind of missing. Like I've always felt that to be missing. Um, as far as what architects can learn from graphic designers, I mean, that's a good question. I would say probably like really understanding how to work with humans would be one of them. <laughs> like, I was a lot more, I don't know, like, you know, I, you know it, when, I was, when I was more architect, like, I was much more like, yeah, you know, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, that's your problem, that's not my problem. And now, like, I'm fascinated by like I have no no longer any kind of like cognitive friction like when I'm sitting in front of somebody who like doesn't understand what I'm talking about or vice versa. Like I just think that's actually a really awesome moment and and I'm and I I like it I think because now I've I've been thinking so much about communication and about how lossy communication is that that like I can find that to be interesting rather than finding that to be irritating and and like, you know, because as a designer, like all you do is that, like you're just constantly trying to explain to people and you're tra translating people. Because like somebody comes to you and they have this like really awesome idea and they just can't, I mean, they can't communicate it. And so you're, you're, you're their sort of midwife, you know, for that. And so you really have to thoroughly understand it and be able to like re-represent it. And, and I just think that whole process of simplifying and clarifying a thought, like I, I think, is a really excellent one, and I think most architects don't think they need to do that. And in like, I whenever I read architectural theory today, you know, like when I do finally like dive into efflux or whatever, like I, I I will love like a whole passage, and then I'll be like, ah, but you know, nobody's gonna understand this. Like nobody knows any of these references. Nobody like, especially if you're a UI designer, for, like if you want to even step into that. Like you have like evidence that like nobody knows how to use a computer, you know. So like it's, 
it's really like you're there's data there that shows you exactly what people know and what they don't know and what they know how to use and what they don't know how to use and so like your view of like humans is very different if you're a UI designer or you're a book designer or you're an architect you know like architects really generally seem to think that people understand most of this stuff and they, they don't so like none of it makes sense Great for thought. <laughs> thank you so much Juliet <laughs>